They've supposedly been seen at nearly every supernatural event. Aliens, UFO sightings, and even Mothman. Always in the background, but doing what? We've mentioned this mysterious group many times before, but we have yet to take a closer look. Until today. For our 100th episode mini-special, we finally dive into the enigmatic Men in Black. This is Red Web. Welcome back, Task Force, to Red Web, the show where we uncover all sorts of creepy, crawly, unknown, unsolved mysteries, cryptids, the supernatural. Today is all about the paranormal with the men in black. I'm Trevor Collins, and joining me with his gut instinct and plenty of questions, Alfredo Diaz. Look, maybe they're not what we think, you know, like Will Smith went like men in black, but I feel Ooh. like they exist in some form or fashion or uh-huh. maybe under a different name. I mean, there's got to be like a division within the government right, that's right. sitting there and then they're just like, they're at the scenes, they're scoping it out, they're taking a look. Maybe not as like, you know, I wouldn't say like dressed in black and white with glasses and just off to the side looking very, uh, just very awkward, ominous and like, oh, yeah, awkward. They're just and hover and <laughs> maybe they're just looking like normal people. Yeah. Just checking out. I mean, on on paper, right? It's got to make sense that the government has some sort of FBI too, you know, something off the books. Yeah. Something off the books where they, it's just very low touch. Mm -hmm. That's why I like this one so much. There's so much grounded reality surrounding this as well Mm -hmm. as the paranormal and the supernatural that surround this, that it's like a perfect merger in my, in my book, I, I just love the idea of the men in black. And so we're going to dive into it, the realities, the supernatural parts of it, and we'll, we'll see if there's something to it, right? Beyond the Will Smith, you know, the time to movie on this one is was short. <laughs> <laughs> How could this it is, not be? You this know? is the perfect excuse for the number one movie podcast about <laughs> mysteries to talk about <laughs> movies. But let's talk about the Men in Black. We're going to go into the description because I'm sure many people have heard not only of the movie franchise, which definitely popularizes a lot of their visual description, but also other things you might not know about them, as well as the classic sightings that really made this part of the zeitgeist. It's just a phenomenon that centers itself around UFOs, ufology, and sometimes cryptids like Mothman. And then we're going to go into some more recent sightings because that's, oh, that's where I love to get into recent history. Recent these, sightings, huh? Yeah. These folks have been stepping around like all sorts of recent events. So we'll go through all of it. Okay. How much do you know? If out of a, on a scale from zero knowledge to 10 knowledge. If it wasn't for the movie, not much. <laughs> okay. Even then that's the movie. Perfect. I would. Yeah. Okay, great. You're, you're strapped in. Buckle those safety belts. We're going in. All right. The Men in Black are said to be part of a secret government agency, and as the legend goes, they seem to be focused on aliens and UFOs, though they have been involved with other paranormal phenomena. Generally, the Men in Black are government agents tasked with preventing the public from discovering things like the existence of aliens, UFOs, and perhaps other fringe entities. Those who publicize their UFO sightings or research are often visited by the Men in Black, and a lot of the stories that we have to tell come from people who have first-hand encounters, sightings, or ongoing research. And as the stories of these encounters go, these Men in Black arrive suddenly, threaten people to stop sharing their stories and their paranormal experiences, and then disappear suddenly, typically without a trace. Others claim that they've been interrogated by the Men in Black regarding their sightings to the point where witnesses feel uncertain about what they saw. This seems to be a common tactic with people that get into a conversation with the Men in Black. It's almost like a psychological tactic where they instill cognitive dissonance in you so you're not certain what was real and what was experienced and what was imagined. And this is kind of an ongoing trend that people experience with them. Mm -hmm. They're going to stir your brains up a little bit. Uh, yeah, like you didn't really see what you saw. It's like, no, I saw that. But like, yeah, but you sure it wasn't the light refracting off of this causing this image. And you go, oh, I guess it could have been right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that just That's what I'm assuming is happening. They're just yeah. throwing a bunch of stuff at you. Wasn't that actually in the lyrics to the Men in Black theme song? Hold on. I need a sidebar. Uh, I mean, possibly. Probably. Means what you think you saw you didn't see. That's in the song. 
Anyway, I just had to scratch Make, that itch. No, makes sense. So let's dive back in. These figures are said to come in groups of two or three and tend to wear incredibly crisp, brand new black suits, hence their namesake. If you were to encounter one of these figures, odds are you'd likely catch them in dark sunglasses, driving an immaculately clean, dark colored car. Almost as if these cars had never been driven before. In some instances, they have strange complexions, sometimes described as unusually pale of skin, and additional descriptions tend to speak to their almost uncanny valley-like faces, right? The uncanny valley is a phenomenon essentially where something is so close to human in appearance, but not quite there, that it instills a great sense of unease or discomfort in the person seeing it. You see this all the time with humanoid robots and um, kind of animations. That's interesting because like this is kind of like more, and I haven't seen this in God knows how long. But the Men in Black is like being described to me right now is kind of like the 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 alien people in Fringe, right? People mm -hmm. with the the Men in Black and Fringe, essentially, in that in that TV show, Ooh. Um, which they were aliens. They were like not of this world or something like that. Uh, I always thought of like the Men in Black as the government, but never thought of them as. Yeah, maybe, maybe they're aliens trying to pose as us. Right. Trying to see what's going on. So I looked up what you were talking about. You're talking about the observers? Yeah, the observers. Oh. Which is like, they're men in black. Yeah, that's exactly what we're talking about. Kind of like featureless face, uh, no eyebrows, no eyelashes. We'll get into a story all about that. One of the classic and recent examples of the men in black. But... Yeah, it's it's interesting how they've been imbibed in pop culture, and we'll get into maybe some of the questions as to why that might be, if that was intentional or not. Yeah, that's taking a that's taking a more like sci-fi turn than I thought it would, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people, and this is jumping the gun on some of the theories, but a lot of people think that this might be some sort of engineered human or an engineered hybrid, right? Of a human and uh, some other unknown species. And so that kind of addresses perhaps some of their uncanny valley-like appearances, but either way, we'll dive into that later. But to add to all of this, one of the, it's a little bit more rare, but it's definitely prominent. One of the other descriptors of these characters is that when they speak, they tend to speak in a strange manner and they behave in ways that don't feel entirely human. I don't know if that means awkward or if it means just strange, but other descriptions of the men in black simply paint them as cold and stoic agents that appear menacing or threatening. And so I can imagine that if you were in a situation that you were confronted by a, an anonymous government agency or someone of this caliber, and they had a very stoic appearance, you might be inclined to read that situation all sorts of ways, especially if they're trying to get in your head. Yeah. I. I don't know. Like, I, I see it as two different. I, I totally see the angle that, that you're putting down. Mm -hmm. I, I definitely just see it as two different things. I, I don't know why, like, if it was the government, mm -hmm. uh, like, why would they? I don't know. Why Why would they be really weird? Not like, and like inhuman like. Right. It stands out. That uh, Right. It kind of just goes along, like, against just like, I don't know. Why wouldn't you just pose as local authorities or something like that and be right. normal? Why don't you activate baseball hat Bobby, right? He comes walking out. He's got a normal hat on. He blends right in. No one's looking at Bobby. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> then, then, then it made sense. <laughs> but right. But I mean, you know, this, this seems like you're, you're drawing attention to yourself. That's, that's low key. So right. I, in, in, my, in my mind, they're separate. Ooh, okay, so you see a government agency that is definitely maybe a little bit more secretive, trying to keep things on the down low. Yeah. Definitely stoic and threatening in appearance. But then you see maybe somebody posing as that, that has some sort of maybe supernatural entity of its own going on. I can see that. Right? Maybe it's like some kind of like alien race. Ooh. Posing as us. Oh, And then man. we're having like breaks in like the fabric of dimensions or something like Whoa. that. Whoa, there's there like some like sort of secret war going on and they're like oh. no we are the government agency i mean there's got to be some kind of i mean maybe not this specifically but there's got to uh -huh. be some kind of secret war being raged right oh, now oh dude absolutely there's some sort of techno babble financial economical like thing going on that we'll find out 10 years from now and go oh thank god i didn't know when it was happening yeah <laughs> oh man scary 
All right. Well, with that said, the descriptors aside, let's dive into the classic sightings that really popularized the concept of the men in black. And then, as always, we're going to those recent ones. On June 21st of 1947, Harold Dahl witnessed a donut-shaped aircraft above him while working on Maury Island in Puget Sound, days before Kenneth Arnold's sighting in the very same area. Now, we mentioned this very sighting and Kenneth Arnold in the Washington, D.C. UFO incident episode a few weeks back, so if you want more detail, please go check that one out. Very interesting stuff. But Dahl reported to his supervisor, Fred Chrisman, who also witnessed the craft, he reported this sighting to him. They kind of went, oh, yeah, we both saw this. And Kenneth Arnold then interviewed Dahl that very next month. Dahl claimed that a man in a black suit approached him the very next day at a diner, told him to stop talking about the Maury Island incident. This was the first documented sighting of the men in black, though the leader of Project Blue Book, Edward J. Ruppelt, considered Dahl's UFO sighting to be a hoax. This is another person that we talked about in that very same episode, so go check it out again. But in 1952, former Air Force member Albert Bender created the first major UFO-related civilian club called the International Flying Saucer Bureau, or IFSB. It was well attended, but he suddenly closed the club in October of 1953, only a year after starting it, with one final newsletter that had this to say, quote, the mystery of the flying saucers is no longer a mystery. The source is already known, but any information about this is being withheld by orders from a higher source. Hmm. Now, see, in that sense, I could I could see that being something that actually happened, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's not necessarily the men in black, but just the government being like, ooh, you shouldn't have seen that. Right. And, and then people were just like, well, we're starting a group. And then they kind of just like went to the head of the group and shut it down. That's, yeah, that's very logical, especially in, and I always try to ground these UFO sightings in the mid-century, try to ground that in reality. There's a lot of forthcoming stealth aircraft yet to be declassified. Yep. And mm -hmm. so we're in the midst of all that flying around and also in the midst of the Cold War. This is a very tumultuous time and you kind of can't have your civilians going, I saw something up there and I'm going to let everyone know about it. <laughs> I mean, the government's going to say, no, please don't. Yeah. So I... I I could see that being actual truth that's stretched to fit like this men in black narrative. Yeah. Like maybe it just happened to be somebody who happened to wear a black suit and uh, they had nothing else going on other than representing the, the government agencies that they work with and saying, hey, by the way, you're kind of tiptoeing around something that's actually deeply classified, yet we can't tell you that. So all we can say is don't. That feels I, a little I less believe sinister. It. Yeah. That, that that makes us a lot more comfortable to me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to me, that's how I'm digesting that. Yeah. Uh, is, the, is the fact that it was just some government person being like, hey, yeah, maybe not necessarily like, being like, yeah, well, we built that thing. But mm. pretty much like they built it, it was seen, and they're like, yeah, let's be hush-hush. Yeah, well, it makes sense, but let's give some more information. When asked about the disbandment, Bender claimed that he had been visited by three men in black in his home. So with regards to this encounter, he had this to say, the men gave him a metal disc with instructions and more information on UFOs. The men also told him to stop researching UFOs. Bender then claimed that they only communicated with him telepathically, that nothing was said verbally. And then following his experience, Bender was sick for several days and when he was finally better on the other side of it, he had frequent headaches that lasted the rest of his life. Now, with regards to the metal disc, a CD comes to mind, but compact yeah. discs weren't invented until the 19, well, until 1979. So maybe they gave him some sort of odd future disc, or it's, I don't know, something less sinister, but. Could be what we always talked about, how it's just like, oh, the government has that tech and it takes, you know, years, decades to trickle down into main media mm -hmm. it's just interesting that you know it does feel exactly like what you're saying it just feels like a government agency saying don't but then in telling the story bender almost maybe and i'm projecting here maybe feels embarrassed by how simple it was or how threatening it was and so then he adds a little bit of flair like oh yeah and they didn't speak with their mouths they spoke with their brains yeah i mean it, this is a lot more sci-fi than i thought it would be Oh, I yeah. really didn't think we'd like be here. Oh yeah. Um, well, trust in me to take you there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
speaking with their minds and then all of a sudden i'm assuming it would be like great like radiation that's left over from right uh, contact with at this point aliens right that's exactly what that sounds like you're right yeah huh sickness with then headaches maybe that that metal disc which by the way can we procure that can we get some tangible evidence get my <laughs> fingerprints all over that well put it like in a i don't know Ziploc. Uh, <laughs> zip. As long as it says like, exhibit a zip, on it. <laughs> like a heavy duty <laughs> Ziploc bag that blocks radiation. Right, right, right. I'm talking about one of those freezer grade Ziplocs. Those things are thick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the ones where you like, you pinch it together, you can see a different color so you know it's zipped. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I'm really curious, like, what did you do that metal disc? But anyway, anyway. It is worth reminding you that Bender wasn't a former Air Force member, so he did work in the Air Force. He might have known... Maybe not about classified aircraft, but I don't know. You you would think that they would know a little bit about a little bit or a lot of it. And um, so it's interesting to me that um, someone from the Air Force would be want to extrapolate some extra details. I don't know. I just don't know how it'd be. I feel like it's just a story that's being like, like, like you're saying, like elaborated on. Right? Yeah, mm-hmm. because I just I just don't know how. We just have aliens that kind of like pose as government people walking around. <laughs> You've seen like, the film? Yeah. That pug you saw? That could be an alien. That's true. It, oh my God. For, you're jolting my <laughs> memories. But okay. All right. So the reason we outline this is not because it is the very first encounter with the men in black, but it is what helped thrust it into the spotlight. It's really what popularized the concept. And so this is why extrapolation of fact, again, I can't prove one way or the other, but this is where extrapolation of fact would really have a runaway effect if it were in fact extrapolations. Now let's talk about somebody else, Gray Barker, who was a former member of the IFSB, that one year club that lasted, went on to write a book in 1956 on Bender's experience this whole thing that we just talked about. And that book was called They Knew Too Much About Flying Saucers. This book also covers the previously mentioned Mari incident as well as the Flatwoods Monster. Now in 1975, the Men in Black reportedly appeared yet again, this time in Point Pleasant, West Virginia. And if that name rings a bell, it's because that is the location of the Mothman sightings as well as the collapse of Silver Bridge. We talked about this in our Mothman episode in great detail, so please go check that out if you want all the juicy deets, but we will outline all the things you need to know in a moment. So journalist and ufologist, ufologist, UFOologist? John? UFOology, yes. When you see it as just a word, it looks like ufologist, but I digress. (laughs) John Keel visited Point Pleasant in order to investigate these sightings alongside local journalists. You might recognize that name from the episode. In his book on this experience, called The Mothman Prophecies, Keel recounts multiple run-ins with the Men in Black, which further popularized this topic, really cementing it in the public arena. Keel wrote that it always seemed like someone or something knew his whereabouts, because he's going around town investigating, talking to witnesses and whatnot. And when visiting witnesses, the family's phone would often ring. Suddenly, they'd get a phone call, and when it answered, no one would be on the other line. And this would continue and continue until Keel left the house. But Keel was very confused because he had never told anyone about his plans, where he was going to go, who he was talking to. So this trend was very odd to him. It was definitely something that stood out and um, would hard to be thought of as a coincidence, right? Like, y- Yeah, it seems very... I mean, if it is to be true, like targeted. The only thing I could say personally is that if you're going to witnesses of a pretty big thing, Mothman or a bridge collapsing, you might be heading towards the households that are bound to get more phone calls naturally, right? You want to talk to them, so. Right. Like you're putting yourself in, in a situation where you're going to be finding that kind of stuff. Right. So. There is that, but the fact that no one's on the other line often is interesting. And I don't know, unless the family's told Keel, I don't know how Keel knows this, but it does seem that the phone calls ended when Keel left the premises. So that is interesting. 
Connie Carpenter reported seeing UFOs as well as Mothman, and soon after, she was visited in her home by someone she described as odd with dark hypnotic eyes. They didn't ask her about her sightings, but asked about local journalist and, well, it also happens to be her aunt, Mary Heyer. And this, through her, is what they said to her. Quote, What would Mary Heyer do if someone told her to stop writing about UFOs? Two men previously asked Mary Heyer directly that very same question. So imagine now you've witnessed either a UFO and or Mothman, and then someone comes to your house, and it's almost like a threatening air. What if, what would happen if someone told her to stop doing what she does as a journalist and as your family member? That's very odd. Again, it's the weird little, like, added spices and flavors of hypnotic eyes. and Right. It's just like, it, it's interesting that everyone has a different way of describing these alien versions of the men in black. Mm hmm. Is there's no like through thread right now in terms of like exactly like they do this exact thing all the time or they they, they have these ex like powers or they're just I guess the only through th thread is like they're just weird. Yeah, they're they're awkward or at least mm -hmm. clumsy with words and always wear a black suit. I would be very curious and this would be very hard to know if Connie or John or anybody else that we've talked about here had previous knowledge of other Men in Black stories that they inadvertently tapped into. Because oh. if these are all, despite it being in the zeitgeist, they could, you know, be insulated from that information. And if they had experiences, to your point, where suddenly there was a commonality between all of these experiences and they didn't know one another's experiences, that would be very interesting. But instead, you're right. You, you're just seeing each of them has something odd to point out. And that, and that oddity, you know, seeing dark hypnotic eyes could be an interpretation thing where if you're under a certain circumstance or if you're propositioned with, a, with, with such a weird question, you might start to interpret their body language differently than if they said, hey, you want to buy a newspaper? Yeah. They had very friendly eyes now. I mean, it's it's just like if we were to go, if I was like to go around and just like, oh man, you know what I mean? Like. Trevor Collins, that man's the smartest, biggest brained, science, buffest scientist I know. <laughs> and then everyone's going to start like analyzing you in that sense, right? When they yeah, yeah, yeah. You. Keep, it, keep like, it out there. How smart is he? How buff is he? How oh, buffest. But like their minds <laughs> just yoked. <laughs> uh, but they're, they're, they're vascular. Mind. My brain is bulging <laughs> with veins. So many wrinkles. <laughs> uh, but I mean, that's what they're going to start like. Like they're going to be in that headspace immediately right 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 like before even i guess just like off a of site before even a word can be spoken they're already in that headspace of like oh my god i've like heard so many things about him being like absolutely insanely smart mm -hmm. and, that's true and it's just like oh okay like that's probably what that situation that's happening here right they, they talked about like you hear about the weird men in black and and how they have all these like creepy like ways about them and yeah. so when they're seeing them, they're maybe it's just someone with a normal stare and they're just like, wow, hypnotic eyes, you know, and it's just like, <laughs> just, just brown eyes, just looking right. real regular like, but what if it was like, like a government agent that was like, they believed in love at first sight. They opened the door. <gasps> That's the one and their eyes widen. But then they're like, but oh, shoot, I still have to ask this question. What was it? And they stumble over their words. <laughs> uh, what, uh, what if, what if she didn't write about UFOs anymore? How about that? <laughs> and so she's like these dark weird hypnotic eyes <laughs> yeah they just kept looking at me and then looking away looking at me but yeah, yeah i think that i think that's what it is like they're uh, the mind is already preconditioned with just right. like weird thoughts and now so they're just looking for anything to kind of and it's already being that thoughts being amplified immediately subconsciously right right so john keel had heard about this character called indrid cold or he's also known as the Grinning Man. Ooh. Oh. So someone named uh, Woodrow Dent Derenberger, he is also from West Virginia and saw an, a UFO. And pretty soon after, he was visited by the Grinning Man, also known as Indrid Cold. So that was in 1966, almost 10 years before. So Keel had 
definitely Keel interviewed this man and he's like featured in the Mothman prophecies a bit. So Keel definitely had a preconceived- Prior encounters? Yeah, or at least new information mm. of similar characters. Wow. Ooh, that's creepy. I don't I don't yeah. like the idea of a grinning man. If no. That's your name? Ugh, it's kind of odd. Ugh. But when it comes to Mothman, there's one more individual that we talked about in that episode we're going to bring back now, Linda Scarberry, because after her Mothman sightings, she also started to get strange phone calls. Scarberry was visited then by the men in black, and they were asking her about her experience with the Mothman. Now, with regards to her encounter, she claims that the Men in Black tried to intimidate her into not telling her story. The intimidation part here is a very common through thread through all these stories. And they also said that the Men in Black drove a black Cadillac and even followed her while she was driving around in that car, which fits some of the older experiences of the Men in Black. But with that said, let's talk about some of the more recent sightings some less recent ones in 1976, but we'll also talk about two that happened within the last 20 years or so. Oh, okay. Yeah. So in 1976, Dr. Herbert Hopkins was a consultant on a UFO abduction case. He too received a call from someone who claimed to be yet another UFO researcher asking if he was alone. Red flags already. Now, while he was on the phone, he happened to look outside and he realized that the person, the man, who was speaking to him on the phone, was also the person who happened to be right at his front door. This strange looking man was wearing a black suit and he pulled out a copper coin. Very strange, but he told Hopkins to pay attention. The man outside took the coin and turned it blue in his hand, then dematerialized it right in front of him before ordering Hopkins to then destroy any files that he had regarding UFO evidence. And then of course, as they do, he left and disappeared into the night. What? Now they're doing magic tricks? Doing some magic tricks now. <laughs> they got a exactly. coin and everything. You can't be a magician <laughs> without a coin. What? What? <laughs> this is... This is taking an insane turn. Oh, I did yeah. not wa- think... One, walking into our 100th episode in black <laughs> kind of makes sense. Like, you know, they're kind of maybe like the all-encompassing. Like, they're there at every different right. weird The puppet situation. master's behind everything. Yeah, uh, mm-hmm. two magic tricks. Yeah, I mean, What's I guess with magic. I just nothing. I just don't think <laughs> that like, aliens natural or the FBI are doing magic tricks of intimidation. <laughs> I just don't see like the government or aliens being hey, just he's criminal. What? Just and he pulls out a coin, right? <laughs> You don't want to do that. Why? And then like disintegrates a coin and then just go, oh, oh well, my God, know. I give up. <laughs> Take me away. I, I, I mean, I, yeah, it would stop You ever me been disarmed my, by magic? It would uh, Look. It's oddly calming and quite charming. I I would think that, yes, it would stop me in my tracks. <laughs> I just, it's just so funky to be just like, check this out. Boom. And then like whether, you know, dissolve a coin and then just. I don't know, very stern, just like, get rid of all the UFO, UFO evidence. Get oh, rid of man. It. Yeah, I, I'm not <laughs> wooed by your, your trickery, Magic Man, because not only did you call me, ask if I was alone, you ended up on my doorstep. I realized that. Suddenly, I'm talking to you for, because Hopkins decided, I guess, to open the door. That's a poor move, number one. you got to stay out of sight. Mm-hmm. And then, coin comes out. And then the threats right after that. I mean, come on. That coin is not doing enough work to soften the blow. But what does stand out to me as a science lover is hearing that the copper coin turned blue. You might not know this, but copper is often blue if you've seen it diluted. I mean, if I saw a solution and I knew it was a compound, I would tend to think that there was some copper involved. Because copper, when it's corroded or when it reacts with certain materials such as sulfur, it does take on a blue hue and it gets a very vivid blue color. And so my mind wants to think that he pulled out not really a coin, but a very thin, thin, thin copper wafer that could then in some way, due to the trickery of your hands, maybe introduce it to some sort of sulfur or other element that could interact with it, corrode it, and then essentially dust it away. So if he crumbled it, it would turn into very small dust particles that would blow away in the wind and and then it would look like it disappeared. That's where I want to disarm this whole magician's trick. So, so then, but also why? Right. 
And so then I guess during this time, the secret government division decided to actually do magic tricks as a form of intimidation, but then to also show that they have powers. You know what I mean? Like that, That's a great point. Imagine <laughs> opening your front door and you see somebody sawing their assistant in half and they're going, sir, I'm going to need you to stop researching <laughs> right. the UFOs. It, it just seems so <laughs> elaborate. I don't pull out a gun. I don't know. Like... <laughs> Right, 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 right. Just, just spout some personal information that no one should know. Okay, mm-hmm. you clearly have been looking through everyone's webcams. I know this is yep. the seventies, but whatever. Spout some personal information and then say, just, just stop, and we're good. Okay, right? right. Or if it was not that that's calming at all, but I mean, no, this whole thing I mean, is not calming. But I just, it's just weird that you would, you would train your officers to do that or know that. Yeah, but if it was aliens. Why would they have a coin with them to do that? Why wouldn't they just grab a random object? Hey, maybe of... they snack on copper. True. <laughs> <laughs> now we're getting Here's into the like the weird, like, oh, maybe they eat this. I-, I feel like you just grab something from the person's home and be like, boom, disintegrate. Right. Right. Like the front door. Boom. Yeah. You yeah. have no choice but to address me. Here's the thing. This feels like a very fringe science form of good cop, bad cop, but it's the same person. Have you ever considered bad cop, magic cop? Might be quite disarming. I, mean, I digress. Like, we got to move what on. What are you trying to interrogate, kids? <laughs> <laughs> Pulls out some long sleeve of scarves from his sleeve. Yeah. Like, you, need, you need to pick a lane, sir. The, these stories have gotten out of hand. A little bit. But thankfully, we have a really interesting grounded story by one Dan Aykroyd. You might know him from such films as Ghostbusters or many, many other films. Well, let's talk about this because I, as much as I love the Men in Black, had no idea that actor Dan Aykroyd had an experience with them. So this happened in 2002. He was in New York City preparing for a show about UFOs and paranormal activity for the Sci-Fi Channel. One day, he stepped outside onto 42nd Street in order to take a phone call. And while he was on the phone, he noticed a black sedan with Men in Black sitting inside. Additionally... There was also one man standing outside of the vehicle, staring Aykroyd down, while the other men in black glared at him from inside the car. So clearly he's like, okay, all eyes on me. This is a kidnap situation. Why does this unmarked vehicle with men in black suits and sunglasses, why are they staring at me? He nervously looked away for a moment because I feel like that's a very natural reaction. But when he looked back, almost a a blink of an eye later, that car was gone. And the car didn't pass him in order to leave. It didn't seem to make a a U-turn because he couldn't see it anywhere. Ackroyd claimed it simply vanished. And then, hours later, on the very same day, Ackroyd was told his paranormal UFO show had been canceled with no explanation. And he claims that he has never been told exactly why that show was canceled to this day. So, it seems a little, like, yeah, they disappeared, but other than that, it doesn't really seem super out there right huh i mean it's a wild coincidence that Very. your that your show is is then canceled oh no i just thought of a cynical reason what he might have ex- <sighs> listen i don't know dan Aykroyd. right just because right. they're an actor doesn't mean that they're like suddenly the most reputable person in the world i mean they mm-hmm. lie for a living but if he's out here trying to have a UFO and paranormal activity show right. and it gets canned, uh-huh. what better way to draw some attention or maybe rekindle that interest than to have a Men in Black story of your own centered around that very show? Yes. Suddenly you're saying, they don't want you to see this, so it won't exist. And then people are going to go, I want to see it. What are the secrets? Right. I mean, mm. if anything, it'll sell DVDs, you know, I don't know. That's true. Like, Early 2000s, flush yeah. with DVDs. Yeah, like what, what harm are you really causing, I guess? I Look, that's that's where my mind's taking it. It's like the show is canceled, and you're just like, eh, I'll make up this wild story as to why it got canceled. Yeah. It also, Dang. like, it could be embarrassing to have a show canceled. Sure, sure, especially if you're not giving a reason. You're just like, well, was it me? Yeah. Did I... Did I? do it oh that i mean even then it's more reason to just make up a reason because then the studio isn't 
giving you one, right? There's no statement. They're just like, eh, it's canceled. Yeah. And you just go, all right, well, I'm just going to make up this wild story because there's nothing going to be put out there to challenge that, really. Yeah. Man, I'd be very curious if uh, there were other eyewitnesses or something, but... It's an interesting story. The first time I read about it going through this research, I was like, ooh, but yeah, now coming through it, ah, I disarmed it. All right, well, let's talk about the most <laughs> recent reported Men in Black sighting. This happened as recently as 2008, and man, was I eager to try to find something even more recent than this, but we'll talk about perhaps why. But yes, this happened in 2008, and if you search the Men in Black, you've likely seen this photo. There is a photo that's going around regarding this story, and as with all visual assets, we will post those on our Twitter and on YouTube, at RedWebPod. Uh, but let's talk about it. This sighting was from a man named Shane Sovar. Sovar managed a hotel in Niagara Falls, and one night, while on the job, he and a security guard spotted a UFO just outside their hotel. Not on the ground, like, parking lot, but uh, up in the sky. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> And it, was just, it wasn't kicking around the back door trying to get in. No. They reported the sighting to the Aerial Phenomenon Investigations Team, a.k.a. APIT, or that's just me, it's APIT. Mm. And the APIT looked into the situation and found that the men in black had paid the hotel a visit. The men scared the hotel employees with their lack of eyebrows or eyelashes. They had freakishly identical pale faces. That was something that they wanted to note, was that the two men that came through looked near identical, and they had abnormally large eyes. So finally, we have a, a commonality with another story. These men also wore black suits and had kind of fedora black hat style hats on. And when they arrived at the hotel, Sovar and the security guard were not there, so they subsequently turned around and left. But luckily, because they arrived on the premises, the hotel security cameras were able to catch a glimpse of these men in black, and this has now been shared worldwide because this is one of the, if not the only, photo of the supposed men in black in action. Oh, yeah, that looks like uh, your traditional what you would think they'd look like. Mm-hmm. Just nondescript black suits. Mm-hmm. One almost looks like it has, or maybe both of them have a black overcoat too. Huh. Yeah, the no one in the bags. front. Ah, I mean, yeah, that looks like, that looks like that would, that's like your classic, like what you think of when you think of men in black. Right. But maybe they're just, I don't know. I don't feel like it's like a, a crazy outfit. No. Right. I don't think it's a hard, uh, an outfit that's hard to get. Yeah, no, not at all. I feel like that's it could be super common. Now, let me ask you this, though. Maybe, I don't know, to, today I think you could make a definitive statement. It's hard to remember back to 2008, but a full black suit, I feel like, is not super common. It's almost so not common now that it would actually stand out. Like, baseball hat Bobby might be a better choice these days. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Who's to who's know you're not just uh, another civilian? That's right. easy. And you don't have to like spend as much time looking good right you just steve jobs it you got this you open a closet full of one thing mm -hmm. slap it on you're good i mean hell like uh what should we call it? undercover cops do it oh and maybe just like an undercover boss i've seen one of them the ceos shave their mustache off maybe these folks shaved off their <laughs> eyelashes so they could skirt under the radar i i don't know it, it's definitely very interesting though because there was a sighting, and then later, after the sighting and after whatever, then they found out some people in black suits came and left again. Mm. No baggage, whatnot. I would be very curious if the hotel employees had anything else to say, but it seems like as, as much as it isn't like way out there, it's not like as supernatural as the rest of the experiences might have been, that almost makes it feel a little bit more compelling to me, especially this security camera image. Yeah, I mean, that. Huh? They look like government people. Like, they could be yeah. government people. But now that, I mean, that's just straight up CIA stuff. Like, when. Yeah. What was that Matt Damon movie where he's going through the doors and he's. Born. Well, there's, there's Jason Born. <laughs> there's the one where, like, they put on these fedora hats and they can walk through the doors. The Adjustment Bureau. Oh. Adjustment Bureau? Oh, if you haven't seen it, check it out. Check it out. It's actually yet another pop culture answer as to what the men in black are. Oh, really? Yeah. These are like folks that operate entirely behind the scenes. They are human question mark. They, they have basically a plan uh -huh. that they help fulfill. 
the plan comes from up top and they basically the plan for everyone's life is set out behind the scenes and these these folks use their hats and suits to kind of go around in a matrix-esque way these back rooms to uh, to kind of guide the machinations of the world and maybe these are just these men in black sightings are just sightings of them in action yeah, it's an interesting I mean, movie. You should check it out. But uh, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna be blunt as well. Um, look, there's there's the government running around. Mm-hmm. Do I think that they are being like I don't know, weird and non human like? No, they're probably just being stern and like straightforward. Right, lack of emotion, intimidating. You know. Yeah. Do I think they're, are they running around like penetrating your mind with their mind and doing magic tricks? Yeah. <laughs> But I do think that there's probably, yeah, like a division of the government that we don't know about that's just running around and questioning people or yeah. trying to get information. And That's what this is to me. That's what this is that, yeah, we can kind of go psychic abilities and all that, but like it could just be a, a very rare glimpse at something that is not super sinister, but also is totally classified and not meant to be known broadly, mm-hmm. which is almost more intriguing to me. But... Uh- but it's so it's so weird that you would do something that makes it seem so known. Ooh, yeah. You know? Yeah. Like like I like I feel like you would just dress like a normal person. Right, right. If you wanted to be so secretive and so incognito instead of like having this outfit, this you know, distinct outfit look. Yeah. Yeah. All right, FBI 2, take it from the task force. All right, I need to see some 5-inch shorts, okay? We're talking from the <laughs> kneecap up. <laughs> I need some pastels on that body. All right. Yeah. We're going to get some yacht shoes. Okay. I need to, I need you to look like you stepped fresh off the sailboat. <laughs> it, it, I mean, that's what I'm no saying. Reason. <laughs> if that, if, if those, if someone looking like that walked in, no one would bat an eye. Right. You're like, that guy just came out of J crew. Okay? Right. I'm not going to think that that is a, an alien debunker. Yeah. If you want, if, if it's like the super secretive, like government agent, I, I don't know. Just dress like a normal person. Yeah, and I feel like you would, you would totally, uh, totally get away with it. Yeah, and, and it's interesting too that this is the last sighting, because as the early two thousands went on, I mean, with extraordinary speed, cameras and technology advanced and became much more prolific. And so the fact that they were nabbed on security cameras almost feels like an oversight, but on their behalf, assuming once again that whatever their true nature is that they do exist yeah. and that they were nabbed on camera they go whoa we got to change our tactics so we might be onto something that they might not even be wearing these suits anymore they could be normal clothes now oh. um, undercover cops do the very same thing and it could be the reason why we see less sightings now in the 21st century there's the increased right of surveillance equipment we have cameras on phones that are incredibly strong and very prolific at this point but also it is worth mentioning, as much as we joked about it, the popularization of the movie franchise Men in Black could be responsible for really making this a household name and almost characterizing them as heroes, which made them much more recognizable, subsequently oh. necessitating a change of plans or the disappearance of this corporate entity or this government entity. That's that's true. Where <laughs> they're just like, oh, damn, like movie popularized, like our secret government agent yeah but also i would be very curious as the early investors of the men in black franchise because who's to say that isn't the government going all right the only way to keep this obscured is to wage information warfare which is to cloud the environment with frivolous stories so you can't tell fact from fiction and and then people are just like what if they're just cosplaying right or you're just like oh yeah you mean that movie and immediately undermines True. For example, your experience. Yeah. Yeah. This episode of Red Web is sponsored by BetterHelp. How we care for our mind affects how we experience life. So it's important to invest time and care into keeping them healthy. There are plenty of ways to support a healthy brain, like learning a new language or taking power naps. There's also BetterHelp Online Therapy. BetterHelp is online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat only therapy sessions. So you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. 
Task Force members get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash redweb. That's betterhelp.com slash redweb. Well, I think we've given, we've played a little bit of our hand, but before we dive into the theories, because there are several to really get into, I'd be very curious as to what your gut instinct says to you right now. Like, where are you at on the Men in Black? I mean, I think that they're like a like a really secretive division of the government and I don't it might not even be like a thing anymore it might have just been like something that was necessary during the time and then mm -hmm. not so much yeah but I don't think they're they're aliens or anything like that the interesting thing is that like the stories were also different usually it's it's they'll have the same powers or the same tactics or something yeah. you know but this was like everyone had like a different experience right it's either that there's a bunch of light stories that all hit the exact same mark, or they are descriptive stories that all kind of orbit the same truth. Yeah. This one feels like a lot of disparate little stories that sometimes overlap and sometimes are kind of on the opposite side of the target. Mm hmm. So for, for me, I feel like this was kind of just like, uh, if it were to be real, I think if anything, like government interrogations, but it was just like, fluffed up to be these mm. elaborate like stories about these men in I mean yeah I could see them actually being men in black and whatnot but no eyebrows and like not quite human-esque figures I don't know yeah I mean if you really wanted to I mean the movie has them melt off their fingerprints right but in real life if you wanted some actual uh, realistic ways to increase your anonymity yeah you might shave your head and your eyebrows and create way less features on yourself you could even powder up a little bit to make your skin look smoother so it's all one complexion and that would create a very eerie you're completely correct i didn't even think about that yeah like when someone does makeup they highlight and you know shadow and you know they get a bit of rosiness on the cheeks i don't i don't know much about makeup but but if you all did one porcelain color it would be that uncanny valley you're talking about you're not wrong actually yeah all huh. right well let's talk about the theories yep so let's start with the first theory that we're going to discuss with very little physical evidence of the Men in Black, some believe these stories have been exaggerated over time, leading to this being nothing but modern folklore. The Men in Black have long been featured in pop culture with heavy connotations to the devil. Let's talk about that a little bit. The Scarlet Letter, the devil in Tom Walker, and the dreams in the witch house are all novels that use a man in black to refer to Satan or have connotations as a synonym for Satan. And that is where this theory kind of finds its foundation. That perhaps there are real experiences that people are having behind all of these stories of the men in black, but because of what was going on in society at that time and all the pop culture at the time, that there could be deeper projections of their fears into their experiences, thereby kind of eliciting some more ex exaggerative things like we talked about, you know, like with somebody beaming thoughts into their mind or melting mm -hmm. a coin in front of their face. Yeah, I mean, like during these uh, these times, like there was, things were wild. Uh, people people were like scared. So I, I, I could see that. It's just, it's just insane that like, this was totally not the direction I thought the Men in Black would be. Like, oh, really? E even, I mean, even now, like in the theories, they're just like, oh, like, you know, they had to, possibly had to do with the devil or were in line with the devil. Right. And, and it's just like, whoa, like we are trying, like, this is touching on like everything. I think, yeah, because it's so ingrained, at least in the time. I mean, it's less yeah. so now, but it's so ingrained in the time that a lot of people step forward to try to figure out what was going on here. For example, folklorist James R. Lewis had a book that kind of talked about this. That book was called The Gods Have Landed. Um, but, but pretty succinctly, he pointed out that the Men in Black encounters could be in some way psychological trauma influenced by the tales from the stories that they themselves or their parents and grandparents were told, such as those books that I, I referenced earlier. Mm -hmm. And so that's really interesting because that's not something we often talk about is that sometimes we're primed based on our upbringings or things going on in society and pop culture to see a certain thing, right? For example, right now, what's heavy 
in society would be the multiverse and the understanding of multiverse, not only because of the Marvel films, but because the the Webb Space Telescope is out yeah. there looking deeper into space than we've ever seen before. And so our storytelling, or even a better example, in the 60s, we were littered with sci-fi of the future because we were all talking about racing to the moon and we were trying to visit like other places. And so yes. our minds were all in line with it. So it's really interesting to have a theory that explains explains something like this that is so interesting yet could be totally normal by way of hey what was going on in folklore and pop culture at that time yeah i mean it, it like a sign of the times you know what i mean mm -hmm. essentially is what, what we're getting at here and i could see that completely you know i mean we'll probably look back a decade from now and be like oh yeah we kind of like thought that way or carried ourselves that way or that I know media carry themselves that way because of just the times and and kind of like the big like thread of that like uh, decade essentially yeah but long story short to kind of really distill the idea of this being a folklore sort of thing basically people were saying that these fabrications whether intentional or otherwise were projections of folkloric representations of the devil right that the devil was coming and interacting with these individuals because of what they were seeing, for better or worse, or other reasons. But with that said, let's dive into one of the more popular theories that is heavily associated with the Men in Black, and that is aliens, of course. Because many believe that the Men in Black themselves are actually aliens in disguise who approach those who see them or have witnessed their vehicles or what have you, and they're just there to simply cover up their tracks, not to make an impact, not to be a lasting memory, but simply wipe their traces clean. This could explain why they often show little to no human emotion, as well as their ability to appear and vanish extremely quickly from those that they visit. I think one thing that's worth really thinking about is human emotion. There are expectations that humans have developed across all cultures in society about how one should act and be and all of that and aliens whatever form they take have no reason to fall within those guidelines emotional or rules or otherwise right yeah no i mean that's that's totally like something that's like a contract that's set by us the human mm -hmm. race like if something is sad it's supposed to feel down and possibly crying and emotional but like who's to say you know like it, like aliens don't need, need to necessarily act that way like maybe to them it's a sign of rebirth or different beliefs could come into play right. so it's just like the it could be a sign of joy because maybe on their planet that means they've ascended like you you have no idea like how a whole nother essentially like what you know could be like a whole nother planet is conditioned to think in terms of like everyday events. Oh yeah, especially if they're so deeply advanced that they could be, you know, imagining they're outside of the solar system, that they're here at our planet with intelligence. Like you would have to know so much. It would be very curious to know how that impacts one's culture to know so much about the universe. But either, either way, I'm getting kind of deep and philosophical, but the reason why a lot of people think in addition to that, um, that these might be aliens, is, of course, because they tend to show up around UFO and ufologists, the, the encounters they're in. Also, upon seeing them, many people thought that they didn't really look quite right, that their physical appearance was a little bit different. For example, Hopkins, during his encounter with the Men in Black, noticed that the man's complexion was inhumanly pale. And not only just pale, but almost looked like plastic. Like, it wasn't natural or organic. It didn't really have wrinkles. It was perfectly porcelain and very pale. Maybe this is somebody with a vitamin D deficiency. I don't, it, listen, I don't know. True, could be. <laughs> but also, I mean, like, it, it could be what you were talking about earlier, and then, like, it's still striking a chord with me. Like, you know, what if they want to be anonymous, right? Shave the eyebrows, shave the head, like, yeah. or, I don't know, throw some low-touch, like, makeup effects on. Yep, absolutely. He also said, though, and this is interesting, because we didn't mention this earlier, that when describing this person, this man, that their mouth was more of a slit, almost like just a hole in the face that was just an opening. There weren't really human lips, as it were, but instead what they had was red lipstick around that slit in the face to 
almost create the illusion of there being human lips. John Keel, who we talked about, described his Men in Black experience as them being awkward and claimed that in talking to them, they never blinked, which is a kind of through thread, right? We've, we've seen now that many people see them as big hypnotic eyes, mm-hmm. huge, unblinking blue eyes. Keel himself is saying that they never really blinked. So at least three occasions that we've talked about today refer to their enormous eyes. And maybe that's why they were sunglasses. Yeah. Who knows? And the, and the hats too as well. Throw so just a little like, I don't know, a little shade, a little mystery where the right. eyes are. Maybe, they, maybe they're the ones that created that look, the trendsetters. <laughs> you know? Just so happy to work out. They're like, yeah, we grabbed this stuff and then uh, became a movie apparently. Yeah. Just lastly though on this, and we, we talked about it a little bit, but them always seeming to know where Keel was and where he was going was kind of interesting. It doesn't necessarily mean aliens, but if they were sufficiently advanced and were in fact aliens, it would address how they knew where he was going without him knowing that they knew and also could explain how they usually, except for the one time, avoided being captured on camera or having any evidence to to capture them. Hmm. Yeah. That's just, I just, I don't know. I feel like it's all like exaggerated. Yeah, it, it could yeah. be. I think it's their proximity to sightings. Yeah, that spurred this one up the most. And and I I feel like there's as as much as like I don't know. Even then, like the sightings never seem like a huge focal point in terms of like what we've discussed. It seems yeah. like they're just kind of at every event. Which also mm-hmm. could be a thing in itself, right? Like it could be just like they're there at the events and we only see them at some events because that's, you know, maybe they're better at hiding or sometimes they're slipped up, et cetera. But all of it very much seems like it's just like blanket statement, right? Or it's like they're aliens. They have all these kinds of different abilities, complexions, looks about them. Also, they show up like in any kind of event. It could be uh, an alien sighting, Mothman sighting, Comic-Con, doesn't matter. Like they, they show up like they're there somewhere. Mm-hmm. And and so the thing for me, it's just like, this is so much more broader than I thought this story was going to go. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. I thought it was going to be more honed in and like we'd have pictures of like oh, people in the background. Right, right. Zooming in hands. So there's somebody back there. Right. Even then, I thought they like a lot more of the events would be maybe like, I don't know, during homicides or stuff like that. A lot of this is like more supernatural or just yeah. like over encompassing like out there events, which is which is not where I thought this was going to go like at all. Mm. Well, I told you to strap in that safety belt. But before we dive into the idea, the theory that these entities or this government agency is real, there's one more, albeit or maybe two more very, very brief ones that I want to touch on. And it kind of goes along with the idea that the men in black lacked emotion, they had weird mannerisms, and that they had that uncanny valley appearance to them. And that would then kind of extrapolate out to be the theory that perhaps these men in black were actually government programmed robots. Well, the wrinkle in that would be to me that these guys showing up as early as the 1940s it would, it would necessitate that the government has a deep knowledge of advanced technologies and had it way back in the 40s and only just now is trickling it out, right? Yeah, you usually see tech trickle out sooner than that. Mm-hmm. And it, if we had the ability for something so advanced like that, I don't know. Like, I'm just not sure we got sentient robots in the 40s yet. Right, exactly. Maybe the and 2040s, I, but... But also, like... What a weird field to test it in. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Yeah, let's just send this full robot out into the world. And the, I mean, it just... Either way, it's a During fanciful theory. To like, but it doesn't address most of it. Yeah, you know? to like interrogate like people. I don't yeah. know. I, I, I feel like <gasps> the field test for that would be something a lot more... I don't know, a lot more concealed... Uh, a lot yeah, more but, concentrated, maybe. But what about the telepathy just being speakers? And the guy's oh. like, I've never heard of speakers. Oh, that, I mean, yeah, that, that could explain that. He's like, his mouth isn't moving. That's an I've interesting, seen, that's a very interesting way. C-3PO's got like a slit mouth, right? It's just a little opening. That's Put a, a little lipstick on that. very interesting way of like, mm-hmm. of, of making a, a reason as to why there was telepathy. 
Mm, yeah. And I think it just necessitates too many other yeah things. And, 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 and just like a weird like chain of thought in terms of like how right. they're dispersed and, and everything about it. Yeah. But before we dive into that last theory, a couple others we wanted to touch on with not really much else to extrapolate on is that this could be a cryptid of its own caliber, right? We've had humanoid cryptids before. This shows up around Mothman and Mothman was humanoid with wings. And so is there some sort of relationship? Is our preconceived notion of what a cryptid is? um, Is it too narrow? Could it expand out to be someone that is so human-like that they could literally just pass as a man in a suit? Who knows? I would still say you could... Like, yeah, I would say you can categorize them as cryptids. Like a like a slender man. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah. Just, just a lot more like real lifelike, essentially. But I never thought about that either. Like, are they just some kind of cryptid? Cryptid. But like, man, what a public facing cryptid. If oh, it yeah. Was, right? Yeah. And, and just I think they're making like, house calls. Right. Exactly. It's like, oh, you don't need to come to us. We'll go to you. Uh, We'll hunt you down. And. Question. Ooh, don't do that. Um, Pass. I guess the motive, right? Like the, yeah. the motives there is is what I'm trying to find. Like, why mm-hmm. do these cryptids care about other cryptids or other events? Uh, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's man. Now my mind is starting to enter the tinfoil area, which yeah. is like like a cryptid it, that overlooks cryptids. Like, yeah, that's like the only thing. A I society think of. of cryptids, like a whole civilization living just around us just beneath the surface which then the people go well, you're just talking about the men in black film again and i go no they got you <laughs> yeah you know if you're trying to hide a secret hide it in plain sight make everyone know it and it won't feel real anyway let's talk about the fact that maybe this is a government entity that exists because we have heard of the sightings and the encounters with the men in black, but it is still a question on who they really were and what exactly they were trying to achieve with their interrogations and full front, that full frontal offense on the squashing information. Mm-hmm. One of the most subscribed to theories regarding the men in black is that they are in fact government officials who are sent to intimidate those who report encounters of UFOs. Some believe that the motive for the government to do something like this may have to do with maintaining power over the people or withholding information that would raise questions about the government's regulation of information. Personally speaking, I feel like it would be an explosion in the public eye to find out about aliens without drip feeding that to someone first. Yeah, there'd be mass chaos. Oh yes, because that would cause a lot of long-standing belief systems to to kind of look inward and question themselves and a lot of identity crises would happen all at once. Yep. And it shrinks the human experience down to the grain of sand in the cosmos that we truly are, but Mm -hmm. it it just, it's a huge psychological shift. And I think that, you know, and a lot of people talk about that and that's why this theory is pretty substantial in a lot of people's minds because confirmation of aliens existence would be dramatic to say the least. Yeah, you, everything would be questioned. Technology, uh, was it God, a higher power, was it aliens? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like er- everything. I mean, you'd start looking at your spouse or your dog and you're like, are you an <laughs> alien? Like everything would be in question. I'd start looking at every dot in the sky and being like, okay, if there's, if finally the Fermi paradox has been kind of addressed or at least not resolved, but spoken to. So if you can be here and now, who's to say that? any other star system can't have any other species or entity to arrive here and if you can do that what other powers do you have right true Ooh, that's creepy yeah very (laughs) very too realistic and too spooky really but i think that's ultimately while typically the idea of it just being a real human thing and it sounds boring and it's mundane Usually that kind of goes, oh, I feel like maybe that deflates the mystery. To me, this is the rare opportunity where it being grounded in reality almost makes it scarier and more interesting, you know? Yeah, because I feel like you can kind of relate to it, right? You can relate to it, but it also does that confirm that there is something to hide? Yeah. I mean, mean, here's the thing. There are stuff 
the hide. Uh, uh -huh. they, uh, this, we don't know exactly what the government's doing at all times, so they're definitely hiding stuff. And rightfully so to some extent, but you know, you won't, you don't want like other governments have full access or just like uh, common men have full access to what weapons of mass destruction, like how many, you know, what we have, how to make them, what it looks like, and all these different chemicals that we have, good or bad, etc. So I, I don't know. Like, I, I feel like the media already, in a sense, tries to like, tries to like direct the narrative or suppress, you know, stories or whatnot. We kind of mm -hmm. do that ourselves with the massive amount of spamming on like social media and like Twitter and all that kind of stuff. Oh but, yeah, information I mean, overload. But yeah, no, I, I see it. I see it as something that 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 can and does happen. So yeah. Well, let me ask you this before I continue because I have a few other kind of like pieces of information that help substantiate this in some way. But if by us doing this podcast and Jillian, I'd love to hear your thoughts as well. If we were reached out to by an unknown entity and they said, stop, what would you do? And I guess maybe it depends on the, the language used and the approach, but like, would you look closer? Would you want to stop? What, like, what is your move? I like, honestly, just because any random person can do it, I think it would be in the context of like how they were reached out. Yes. Like if it was an email, I'd be like, I mean, I need If someone showed up at your door in a black suit. Well, then yeah, I would take it seriously. Yeah. Right. Because I mean, like that's spooky. That you're right. The, like they they have access to information. Now, how about this? They do a coin trick in front of your face. Now, now, how do you feel? I would give them whatever they want. <laughs> I would give them whatever the hell they want. <laughs> They're like, all right, great, great, go away. <laughs> I would, I would honestly, I'd, I'd, man, I'd be like, son of a, you know, like mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. it's actually real. They actually did study these coin tricks, like. I would. I might. I might geek out. I might. I might want to take a selfie with him. I feel like. Damn it. <laughs> I feel like you'd be the person that is probably the most annoying person to do that to. I'd be like oh, another. Because I oh, feel yeah. like you'd you'd break it down, you know, in, in the scientific way, like you right. described earlier, and you're like, oh my god, is that is that that chemical mis mixing with this mineral, et cetera. And then they'd show mm. you another one. You'd be like, Ooh, you're doing this. Are you doing this with that? And they'd be oh. like, come on, man, it's actual magic or it's actual, like, like alien technology. And you're just trying to make sense. You're just like always trying to find some way to make sense of it. Like, oh, wow. Yeah. I love the iodine clock reaction. That is, you right. know what? That's a great trick in the book. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it'd be like this. Someone get like a bigger coin or something. I don't yeah. know. Like. Somebody get this man a comic <laughs> book or something. But Jillian, I want to I want to pose that pose that question to you because you've been doing a lot of the research for this episode. You went into the Mothman Prophecies book to really get into some nitty gritty details. So how would you feel? Because you're on the docket, baby. Um, I'm already. You know the info. It. I'm already terrified that it will happen. Oh um, no! <laughs> if someone showed up at my house. Yeah, I would immediately quit this job and y'all would, you would, <gasps> you would know. I'd yeah, be like, no. see ya. No explanation. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, well, if that happens, oh, man, Fredo, we have some investigating to do. Yeah, no, we got to, <laughs> like, things are going down. But with that aside, let's recenter back into the idea that this could actually be a government agency because there are public grains of truth that relate to this and could actually maybe be one and the same. For example, Project Blue Book, who we talked about earlier, as well as on the Mothman episode, was a pretty well-known US government program that actively investigated UFOs and alien sightings. This program existed from 1952 to 1969, which was very much the heart of the time frame where the Men in Black sightings occurred. So maybe there is there could be a one in the same sort of situation here or by the fact that one program definitely existed it could imply that maybe a secret program existed either way yeah i could see that where there were like it was like essentially mistaken for an actual program that existed mhm mm i mean especially when you look at the sightings jillian when looking at this was like there were a lot of sightings during the run a Project Blue Book, but there have been very, very few sightings of the Men in Black, especially nowadays, perhaps due to the fact that the Project Blue Book was disbanded. Again, it could be that maybe it was Project Blue Book or some offshoot of it. 
either way, because Project Blue Book was present in a lot of places that witnesses saw UFOs. And they, they did a lot of interviews with witnesses as well. True. So, I mean, that honestly ties in nicely to what I'm leaning towards, which mm -hmm. is the fact that it's just the government. Right, 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 right. A kind of minor wrinkle, though, uh, comes from Edward J. Ruppelt, who said this of the Mari incident that we spoke of earlier. Quote, The reason for the thorough investigation of the Mari Island hoax was that the government had thought seriously of prosecuting the men. At the last minute, it was decided, after talking to the two men, that the hoax was a harmless joke that had mushroomed. End quote. Essentially, that had just blown up out of proportion. Huh. And so, this could be how a normal interview could be perceived as a pretty harsh one and that suddenly that reputation precedes them because in this one incident they're trying to prosecute so yes you would have a much more authoritarian disposition right yeah i, I think honestly it there is truth to it but it's just taken out of context or, or like greatly exact like mm -hmm. exaggerated there was a writer who was also a skeptic named Brian Dunning, and when talking about this sort of thing, talking about witnesses being interviewed about their paranormal experiences, one of the things he said was, typically, these individuals being interviewed don't come away feeling threatened after their interviews. They almost feel like they were able to get something off their chest and almost help in whatever research or investigation was ongoing. And so Brian Dunning is essentially saying that these Men in Black interviews feel fundamentally different. But again, using Edward J. Ruppelt's kind of quote there, it could be that this intimidation was specific to one event and maybe became more prolific than intended. I don't know. I can see that part going either way. I'm not going to really hang my hat on the whole theory based on just kind of people's gut feelings. Yeah. And like kind of like one core event. Mm hmm. Either way, though, in the end, when it comes to the Men in Black being real or not, the fact is, and we've talked about this lightly over the course of the episode, from the idea of the Men in Black films to aliens and pop culture with War of the Worlds as a, as a novel then made into a film, like, there are so many, I mean, even Marvel, like I mentioned, there are so many more pop culture references to aliens that I think the general populace is now willing to accept the idea of aliens. And Jillian wrote in into the theory section, essentially saying that this could also address why we don't really see the Men in Black as much anymore, because it went from a very taboo, like, oh, what's in the sky sort of situation, where that kind of elevated the stories of the Men in Black, to now the general populace is not kind of writing home about UFOs very often, and it's also much more part of society and pop culture that perhaps we're just not looking for them anymore, or their job isn't as necessary anymore that is interesting i feel like you'd still want to you're still there kind of like cover up yeah just in case you're right you don't kind of just go ah eh, movies have desensitized people uh-huh uh we don't need to kind of keep an eye on alien sightings right right i, th I think that's a crazy thing to just be like that's so much faith in humanity <laughs> right well, they can also telecommute in too. They could just give yeah, you a little uh, a little FaceTime and just be like, mm -mm, don't like, no, do no, it. no, you didn't see this. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe they now they have the brain scrambler, right? From from them. Maybe that actually exists now. They got the noisy cricket and they got the little like, hey, look at this light. Oh. And you just forget it. Man, I feel like there's just no way something like that exists without just scrambling your brain. I feel like if something like that existed in any way, it would not be targeted memory wipe. It would be your entire person is now wiped from your brain and it, you are turned to mush. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's terrifying. Yeah. I don't like that you put that in my head. Either way, the true men in black, however it falls out, could be much more mundane than these stories let on. These stories could be exaggerations of the truth due to fear or even a little combination of theories due to folklore from olden days that people had primed in their mind. But I think our disposition is pretty clear throughout the uh, entirety of this episode that it's very likely in my mind that this was some sort of classified government effort in some way and that there might have been odds and ends that were very strange about it because the subject matter surrounding it's a bit strange. Right. And also like the times as well. Right. 
So, I don't know. Again, it is very strange to, to be like, oh, thankfully it's just a real thing. I think <laughs> it makes it much more, I don't know, much more interesting and much more eerie that it could be a real entity. It just reminds us of what we don't know and uh, what else might be out there that is being hidden from us for whatever reason, protection or power. Or I agree. I think, I mean, look, for multiple things, uh, throw everything at it, just like the men in black or just like, wow, it's all encompassing um, this episode. But I, yeah, I, I feel like for, I don't know, for this, the sake of saving humanity from itself to wanting power to um, curiosity, I don't know. Yeah. All of it. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we finally got to talk about this one because this has been one of my my faves from the beginning. I've dropped those breadcrumbs. If you've listened to all 100 episodes, I'm sure you could make a drinking game out of the times I've referenced Men in Black throughout the episodes. But thank you all, Task Force and Fredo and Jillian and Christian, for joining us all here on our little mini celebration of 100 episodes. 100. 100 episodes, dude. That's pretty crazy. That's two years of listening to this podcast straight. That's uh, that's insane. And I, I like to think like the one big thing for at least you know, this episode of The Men in Black was that photo. Yes. I would like to think that's just two, two men. That's going, just us, baby. Going to a me. conference, you know. Yeah. And there, and everyone's like Men in Black, and they don't even know. They have yeah. No, they have no idea that these this photo is being passed around. Right. They're telling stories of their grandkids. Like yes. I remember when I saw Niagara Falls. The hotel was moist, oh, damp. God. I went in to get a room and I hated it. So your father and I left. And it was just two men in suits, you know, kicking it, trying to find a nice hotel. Yep. And then <laughs> and then now it's just like, and they, I like the thing too, like they just have no idea. Yeah. Their photo is being looked at as like the men in black. They just yeah. Don't, yeah, they're just going about their lives. I love that idea that there are photos of people out there that is that a time traveler? Is that the men in black? Is that a cryptid? And it's just someone somewhere yeah. living their life has no idea. You has could be no, a cryptid no somewhere. Clue. True. I love that. Well, before we depart, I want to throw out my own definitely made up, but unless they listen to this podcast, they won't know anecdotal experience with the men in black. I think we we need to start talking about our other senses. You know, we're, we're getting mind wiped. We have telepathy on the table. We have mm -hmm. alien faces, weird makeup, all right? No one's talking about their smell. They smell good, they got that Gucci cologne, or do they smell like onions? Well, I, oh. think, we gotta, I think we gotta put it out there that they smell vividly like baked beans. Like baked beans? Absolutely. Oh, if I smell someone that smell like baked beans, I'd just <laughs> think that they're mushy on the inside. Oh no, that they're just like a sack filled with baked beans. Yeah, I would just think, oh, you just imagine mushy, that handshake. Just a mushy person. Yeah, that's my, that's my alien guy. That's my cryptid. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all again, Task Force, for listening, supporting this show in the various ways you can do it. It, it really means a lot, and we've been able to do a hundred episodes with many, many more to come. We've planned out through the next many months, at least. So hey. Our lease on this uh, this plot of land and our ever-changing headquarters is still a go. But with that said, Fredo, I'll see you right back here next week for another mystery. This time, we're diving back into the internet. Oh. Yeah. The men in black weren't aliens. I take that stance. Brave. Yet true. Yeah.